Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to this LEARN online symposium. My name is Stan Roxon, and I'm really eager to welcome you to this symposium because I have the distinct opportunity today to tell you about how you as the lymphatic community can participate in ongoing research that will make all of our lives better. I have the privilege of being a co-founder of LEARN and currently serve as the chair of the Scientific and Medical Advisory Committee of LEARN. And we have many exciting projects that I think are important and interesting to the lymphatic uh, community. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective on exciting developments in research and in the underpinnings for research. And all of this will lead up to uh, a discussion about our project, which is now more than 10 years old, to establish a registry and a biorepository for patients who have uh, lymphatic diseases and specifically the largest group of those individuals will have lymphedema. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of LEARN uh, the generous support of the sponsors for this uh, program, which you see listed on this current slide. And then I need to also share this disclaimer with you that LEARN sponsored information is provided for use to you, uh, but that uh, we're not taking the, uh, the place of your healthcare professionals. So um, I wanna start in a somewhat humorous vein, but, but actually the thought is not so humorous, which is I suspect all of you that are living with lymphatic diseases have felt at some time or another, or perhaps even quite recently, that your healthcare professionals have this sort of response to your problem. And I, I think that really has been the crux of the problem in lymphatic disease for as long as I've been involved with it. But things are changing. Um, I can't yet say that lymphatic disease has become hip, but it certainly is getting a lot more respect than it has uh, in the decades um, that I've been obser an observer up until now. Um, for those of you that watch CNN, you might have um, tuned into this story a couple of years ago where it was reported also in the newspapers that there was a new found organ in the body that might be the biggest. And it was very surprising to the reporters and to the general public that there is this place in the body called the interstitial space that is so important to the function of the body. Well, guess what? This is the space that is controlled by the lymphatic system. And really, I think this is in many ways the dawn of the importance of the lymphatic system uh, to the general community. In a somewhat more lighthearted vein, I can tell people that I've been surviving this pandemic in part because I can sit down every day and do the New York Times crossword puzzle before I start my day. And I was delighted about two or three weeks ago that we even made the New York Times crossword puzzle because there was a clue that said cause of swollen feet and ankles and the story and the answer was edema. So here we are. Uh, really in the mainstream. Um, speaking more seriously, I'd like to point out the fact that uh, since about 1940, we have seen a growing and now exponential rise in the number of publications that are listed in the National Library of Medicine as pertaining to the lymphatic system. And I think this is uh, simply um, evidence of the fruit of all of the labors of the investigators who are increasingly devoting attention to the lymphatics and also um, uh, making significant strides. Uh, as many of you know, LEARN uh, has as its official uh, organ for scientific uh, research publication, um, the journal called Lymphatic Research and Biology. I have the privilege to serve as editor-in-chief of this Journal, and we also have seen a significant increase in the impact of our journal this day 
couple of years ago, but I'm happy to say that we have maintained um, this steady growth and we uh, look forward to uh, much more in, in, the, in the coming days. I also would like to uh, share with you the fact that the National Institutes of Health, which, are, which is the source of the most important research dollars that we have in the United States, is increasingly interested in lymphatics as well. We have helped to form what is called the Trans-NIH Coordinating Committee for Lymphatic Research that has been active uh, since about 2004 and continues to thrive, continues to provide avenues for exploring uh, new sources of funding and new initiatives at the NIH. I'm happy to say that in 2008 or thereabouts, uh, when I um, worked uh, actively on the NIH campus, I was able to organize this intramural symposium for lymphatic research in which we brought together all of these investigators working on the NIH campus in many cases having never directly interacted with one another and brought them all together for a one day symposium so we could all hear about uh, research that was actually going on on the NIH campus. So a lot of ferment in, in the governmental support for lymphatic research. And again, I hope one day soon we will all reap the benefits of, of this. Uh, to give you one specific example, a few years ago, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is really our parent institution at the NIH, called for um, proposals to create um, a research priority for the institute, which has one of the biggest budgets on the campus and is really very uh, important to lymphatic research. And uh, we, as LEARN, submitted one of those research priorities, which actually became uh, included in the overall list, which was to define how specific lymphatic immune and non-immune circulatory functions interact with and contribute um, to uh, health and uh, resilience. And so we are now part of the central mission of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. A similar initiative has recently been launched by NIDDK, the Institute for Digestive Diseases and Diabetes. And once again, we have submitted proposals and are very optimistic that we will be included in, in that research initiative as well. I've been a, a, a long time proponent of a concept that I've called the lymphatic continuum. And basically what this means uh, in, in simple terms is that there is at least indirect evidence that the lymphatics participate in the expression of a broad host of diseases that go well beyond the lymphatic circulation itself. And we're going to get to those in just a minute. But here is just a short list of these disease categories in which lymphatic biology and lymphatic research is certain to play a very, very important role in the present and in the future. I just want to show you a couple of examples of this. Um, one very exciting one is that uh, historically, we've always believed that the lymphatics are distributed all through the body, except in the brain and the central nervous system, because it was always believed that the uh, cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain uh, takes the place of lymph. And so it was just presumed that the lymphatic circulation was not present there. But so, so if you look at this left-hand panel, you can see a traditional drawing of the lymphatic anatomy. But based upon recent observations, we now have discovered that in fact, there is a lymphatic circulation in the brain. This is what it looks like when you uh, do direct staining of it. So all of that dark green that you see is actually the lymphatic vasculature on the surface of the brain. Why is this important? Because we now have a growing body of evidence that the lymphatics may play a central role in how aging diseases of the brain like Alzheimer's actually come into being. Alzheimer's is a protein deposition disease in the brain, and it is very likely that those excess proteins that form the plaques that disturb the function of the brain reside there because they're not able to be adequately cleared by this newly discovered lymphatic circulation. So lymphatics may actually be the key to Alzheimer's disease, a key that has not uh, allowed this lock to be unlocked until uh, the present, but maybe the lymphatics will be the answer. A second area, very important to me as a cardiologist, is the notion that 
VEGFC, which is the major growth factor for lymphatics, may actually prevent heart failure by helping the heart to heal when it is damaged by events like myocardial infarction or what we would commonly call heart attack. So um, these are just a couple of areas where the lymphatics are becoming important outside of the realm of the lymphatic circulation. But let's now zero in on the lymphatics themselves and the entities that are of utmost importance to what I presume is today's audience of individuals who either have lymphatic disease or are affected by individuals that they love who have lymphatic disease. So let's start with primary lymphedema. Primary lymphedema, as many of you know, is the form of lymphedema that occurs because the genetic blueprint of the body predicts that this problem will occur, presumably on the basis of malformation of the lymphatics or, or uh, an alteration in their structure. I want to just say a word about the tremendous um, advances that have occurred in the field of genetics. Now, primary lymphedema represents only about 1% of the lymphedema population, but it's very important because as we understand the underpinnings that lead to these genetic um, uh, misrepresentations, we learn important things about how the lymphatics are put together in general. So this is a um, a uh, publication from some of our colleagues in London, Christiana Gordon and colleagues have put together an algorithm for how we evaluate patients with primary lymphedema. And I know that this slide will not project terribly well on your screens, but if you look in each of these colored boxes, you will see some red print and each of them represent specific genes in which mutations have been identified that lead to the development of these lymphatic uh, defects that we call primary lymphedema. Uh, so these are all advances that have occurred in the last 10 years, and these are tremendous. I think these uh, doors ajar will help us to understand how we can treat and perhaps prevent lymphedema in general, not only primary, but also secondary lymphedema. I'd like to zero in uh, from here into some of the yellow colored boxes on this slide, which represent the lymphatic malformations. Lymphatic malformations and complex malformations represent the fact that during development, we have a central origin of all parts of the circulation, uh, arteries, veins, and capillaries, and lymphatics. And if things go awry in this development, we can develop all sorts of malformations of various aspects of these structures or in combination. So uh, at LEARN, we're most specifically interested, of course, in lymphatic malformations, combined lymphatic and venous malformations, and even venous malformations as well. And um, many of these, again, have a common origin. What we've learned in recent years is that there are pathways, that these are enzymatic pathways that end up, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but down at the very bottom of this uh, schema, you see um, a molecule called VEGF, which controls the development of blood vessels, including lymphatics. But we now understand what are the enzymatic processes that control whether or not VEGF gets expressed. And it turns out that this, these points in the pathway are points that we can alter the uh, expression of these pathways. And in case of uh, vascular malformations, typically these are overexpression pathways where we wanna tamp down this particular system. And we now have drugs that can do this. Most importantly, in over a number of years, we've been able to evaluate the effect of so-called mTOR inhibitors. Um, and, and now we actually have, in addition to surgeries, which are often frustratingly um, uh, insufficient to solve the problem, and many of these patients die in childhood, we now have drugs that can actually reverse the effect of these malformations, which are often quite devastating. So um, I know very few of you on the call are going to necessarily be adept at reading MRIs, but as an example, look at this child treated with an mTOR inhibitor. This is the disease prior to treatment, and here is the same individual several months later where there has been dramatic regression in this overgrowth syndrome of the lymphatic malformation. And you see a second example of a second child uh, below. 
In addition to the mTOR inhibitors, which are widely available, we now also have inhibitors that are under development or under investigation at various points in this enzymatic tree. So as time goes on, we will have better and better ability to deal with specific forms of these uh, malformations. So this is a very, very exciting development, the medical therapy of life-threatening lymphatic disease. Now, my personal career in investigation has been heavily devoted to lymphedema. And many of you who are familiar with my work know that I've been on the trail of inflammation in lymphedema and the ability to treat lymphedema with drugs as well. So I'd just like to summarize a little bit of where we have come with all of that work. Um, I've been perplexed from, from the beginning of my career about why it is that lymphedema, which like all edemas starts as pitting or the ability to move fluid freely through that interstitial space that CNN reported on to a point at which that pitting quality goes away. And the corollary of this is that as the pitting goes away, also goes away the ability of the lymphedema to respond to a lot of the manual therapies that are so effective earlier in the disease. And yet we've had no real understanding for why lymphedema uniquely behaves this way. I suspect not all of you on the, on the call are, uh, are fluent in French, but what this says is every why has a because. And I think the importance of research is to find out the because to explain the why. So why does that transformation occur? We need to understand. So what we did uh, back perhaps 15 or more years ago is to develop an animal model in the mouse tail in which we can actually induce lymphedema, measure it, and actually then use that as a throughput model to understand the mechanisms that drive the disease. And what we found when we did that is that uh, in lymphedema, there is this tremendous signal that represents inflammation. We don't see a lot of attributes that point specifically to the lymphatic circulation. Everything that we see points to the inflammatory uh, substrate that drives this disease. We subsequently repeated very similar work in human lymphedema and found that the expression patterns were identical, a very, very heavy component of inflammation, which opens the door to shutting down the inflammation as a way potentially to reverse the disease. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we um, determined what the inflammatory pathway was uh, that was involved in lymphedema. And what we found is that when we treated with drugs to, to specifically inhibit that pathway, we not only made the lymphedema better, but we also improved the elasticity of the skin. We, uh, we basically addressed those irreversible, so-called irreversible attributes of lymphedema that were such a mystery about why this disease transformed over time. And it turns out that it is reversible and it is based in large measure on the uh, underlying inflammatory uh, substrate that is present. We um, have completed a placebo-controlled trial of this form of anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory therapy and showed that it is effective. And this is one of the figures that did not make it into the study, but what it shows you, uh, or not into the study, but into the publication, what it shows you is that when we give the active drug, we both reduce the thickness of the skin, that is the, the, this slope of this line shows that the um, effect of the drug is to move in this direction, which is both to reduce the thickness of the skin and to reduce the size of the lymphatic vessels that are present in the skin, which is not the case when you give the placebo. Uh, now, what we learned is that not all anti-inflammatory drugs are equivalent, and that shouldn't be a surprise because inflammation is a very complex beast. So we found that when we inhibited the pathway that we were interested in very, very directly, we saw tremendous structural improvement in the mouse model. This is a reconstruction of the mouse tail. But if we used the wrong drug, we saw no effect or perhaps even worsening of, of the disease. But what we learned is that when we use the right drug, we can take 
this transformation that lymphedema creates, here's normal lymphatic capillaries in the mouse tail. They become completely disrupted when lymphedema occurs, and this is what's called dermal backflow in a human lymphocytogram. And as little as one week after giving the specific anti-inflammatory drug, we more or less restore all of the anatomic structure and function to normal. So this goes along very much with what we see under the microscope, which is that both in human and mouse lymphedema, when it's untreated, we see this tremendous dilation of lymphatic vessels in the skin because they're not competent and they simply fill up with fluid. And yet when we treat with the drug, all of those dilated channels go away. And what we have learned in our subsequent animal work is that this is because when we impair that inflammatory response, we actually allow the lymphatics to regenerate and to heal themselves. I will just briefly take the time to show you that in the mouse model, if this will work, in the mouse model, um, after we give the drug, now here's where we create the lymphedema surgically. This is the part of the tail going back to the mouse's body. This is the part of the tail that's edematous. You can see that we restore lymph flow in the channel that previously was not carrying lymph flow because of the surgical interruption. This is simply because of giving the anti-inflammatory drug. Now, many of you know we've completed a second clinical trial um, using that more specific drug that I showed you just now in the mouse model. Um, almost every day of my life, I get asked what the results of that trial uh, will be. Unfortunately, the um, the analysis is not so easy. It was a very small trial, and uh, we're having to dig very deep to understand what we've learned, but we're nearly completed a lot of the molecular studies that came out of that trial, and I hope that within the coming months, we'll actually be able to publish that and move on to the next phase of the work. Moving on to another topic, what about preventing lymphedema? Well, some of you know that I may that I have been involved with uh, um, some scientists in developing scaffolds that we think will help to um, generate and support new lymphatic growth. Uh, now these are fibers, basically. Uh, you can see what it looks like when it's held between the fingers of a surgeon. Um, it's, it's not very big and it is able to be uh, placed into a surgical field, but when you look at it, under the microscope, I'm gonna show it to you an even greater cross-section. Um, this is what that uh, tiny scaffold looks like uh, under the transmission uh, microscope. And uh, to use the terminology of the English muffin, these are all the nooks and crannies within the scaffold where the lymphatic cells like to migrate and to live. And these actually form super highways for uh, new lymphatic channels to develop. This is what they look like, the, the endothelial cells from the lymphatics when they grow on the scaffold. So when we place these scaffolds into a mouse model again of lymphedema, this mouse, if we did not place these scaffolds, would develop lymphedema uh, in this uh, hind paw because we interrupt the lymphatic channels up above by removing the lymph nodes and, and giving radiation therapy, just like the surgical uh, situations in which this occurs. But when we place the scaffolds across the surgical field at the time of surgery, what we discover is that these animals do not develop lymphedema and all of the lymphatic flow becomes directed to the opposite side of the body where it can be handled completely normally. So this is in essence a way to prevent lymphedema. And the vision is once we perfect this, that such an approach could be used at the time of the cancer surgeries that cause lymphedema. It's still heartbreaking to know that somewhere between 15 and 30% of breast cancer survivors, for example, will develop lymphedema. And this may be completely preventable if we can uh, undertake measures that will allow the lymphatics to become protected uh, as the cancer is being surgically treated. I'd like to move on to my last area of research, which has to do more with lipedema. Many of you know that lipedema is a distinct disease that resembles lymphedema. It's often confused with lymphedema, and both of these are com confused often.
with obesity. This is what lipedema looks like, and I'm not going to get into um, a tremendous detail because we don't have much time today, but lipedema has been somewhat of a mysterious disease. I've always believed, and there is some oblique evidence that it is a lymphatic problem. Uh, others think of it more of a fat disorder, uh, but here's what I can tell you about uh, lip lipedema until very recently. The diagnosis of this condition has been purely clinical. There are no imaging attributes that are characteristic of it. There have been no identified biomarkers. And even when we look at tissues under the microscope, they're not particularly helpful in establishing the diagnosis. We've just published the results of a study, which I think is fairly groundbreaking. Uh, and it is so for a variety of reasons, but we basically made some discoveries in uh, and, and some animal models that look at obesity versus a lymphatic uh, cause for obesity. And that allowed us to make some discoveries, which we then took uh, into the human setting. This work was done in collaboration with my colleague at Northwestern University, Guillermo Oliver. Uh, and basically, once we made this discovery, we decided to look at three categories of lymphatic disease, lymphedema, lymphovascular disease, which includes primary lymphedema and uh, lymphatic malformations, and patients with lipedema. And what we found is that uniquely in all of these settings, and specifically in lipedema, there is an increase in the expression of a newly identified biomarker that is associated with lymphatic disease called platelet factor 4 or PF4. And interestingly enough, while the PF4 is elevated in all of the lymphatic patients. It is not elevated in individuals who have obesity, nor is it elevated in normal controls. So when we look at all of that data, we find that all of the, that, the lymphatic diseases have a greater than 90% specificity uh, when PF4 is elevated. Basically, what this means is that this is a finding that has the strength to be a clinical tool. This is a biomarker potentially for the identification of occult lymphatic disease and also of lipedema. So this is what platelet factor four looks like. And by X-ray crystallography, it doesn't tell you much beyond a simple, interesting uh, uh, diagram. But what I want to point out is that at first blush, one would not think of PF4 as a lymphatic marker. None of these None of these uh, entities list the word lymphatic in them, but it's likely that by its ability to inhibit angiogenesis, which is the new development of, of vessels, and the ability to call inflammatory cells into the tissues, this is likely where it plays its role in lymphatic disease. Now, um, what I've described for you in the last few minutes is all of the work that has relied heavily on mouse models uh, where we can make discoveries that we can potentially then take to the human arena. But there's a couple of problems with this. Number one is mouse models are not always predictive of human disease. I've had the great fortune to work with a mouse model that has been heavily predictive for the human situation, but it's not always the case. And research, um, the research arena is littered with cases where exciting discoveries have been made in mouse models that simply have not panned out in the human. And in other cases, in lipedema, for example, there is no mouse model. And so we, if we're going to make discoveries that are related to certain human diseases, we really don't have a way uh, to do this in animal models. I think lymphatic malformations are another example of this, which brings me to the important topic for today, which is our International Disease, Lymphatic Disease and Lymphedema Registry and Biorepository. We first had this vision in around the year 2000, uh, where we realized that to bring this field forward, we needed to aggregate this patient population into a database that could be mined for important information and that would serve as a link to valuable human specimens that already exist that could be used by scientists when they understand the specific clinical presentation that they might be interested in. So making discoveries about human disease 
in human materials, whether those are surgical specimens or DNA specimens or blood samples or serum or plasma or autopsy specimens, whatever they may be. And we've now created a network of, of repositories around the world that represent um, materials that are going to be available to scientists around the world using this registry as a platform to find them. But the registry also contains information that has value simply unto itself because it is such a rich repository of all of the information that we might want from the lymphatic disease community. So if you go to the LEARN website, you will find a link that will in turn take you to this entry page where we initially explain what the registry is, what the biorepository is, and you have the opportunity to register. Once you understand what it entails to be a part of this registry, you sign your consent online. Um, this is a de-identified registry that is securely stored on the Stanford servers. Nobody will ever be able to find you as an individual in this registry, but every piece of information that's important about you clinically will be there linked to you as an entity that's not identified and linked to all of the other individuals who share your common attributes. So as you go through this registry, which will all be um, a, an interaction that is performed online, you will have a series of question pages that look something like this. Um, you start by identifying yourself. That's so we can interact with you if we need to get additional information, but again, not discoverable by anybody on the outside. You will then be asked a series of questions about yourself. Everything that you have the ability to answer because it's about you. These are all the questions that you wish your doctors would be thorough enough to ask you uh, when you go in to see them for help with your lymphatic problem. Uh, now this process will take you perhaps as much as 30 or even 45 minutes because we have made this registry as exhaustive as it possibly can be. We're asking everything about your personal history, your family's history, your past medical history, your uh, social setting, your uh, financial and economic underpinning as it relates to your, uh, to your problem, your uh, insurance um, issues, the cost, to your personal finances that it, uh, that it uh, uh, engenders to have these lymphatic problems, everything that anybody might want to know about the problem of lymphatic disease and lymphedema. This will one day be important as we uh, ask the government to be more active in supporting the care that is necessary for lymphatic diseases. It will be important to third party payers. It will be important to commercial entities that want to develop new products related to lymphedema. It will be important to epidemiologists who want to understand exactly how much lymphatic disease is out there. And it will help scientists to understand um, what the patterns are of lymphatic disease. I'd like to say that with tools like this, anything is possible. And I want to strongly encourage you uh, as a, a patient community to ask your questions, but hopefully I will have ignited in you the interest and the desire to be an active participant in research by devoting 30 or 40 minutes of your time to enrolling in this project so that you can be part of the aggregate whole of the information that we're acquiring and that you will provide the materials that scientists need uh, to, to um, make the kinds of advances that I've tried to share with you uh, in small measure this morning. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop um, my formal comments. There is a question and answer uh, function on this um, a webinar symposium, and I will try to address as many of the questions as I can while we have time to share with one another. 
Uh, and uh, if we don't get to your question or there are questions that you think of after this webinar is over, I would encourage you to contact LEARN uh, for further information. Uh, once again, I really want to encourage you, if you are motivated by what you've heard today, to go into the LEARN registry uh, via, um, via the LEARN website at the uh, end of this symposium so that you can become a part of this initiative. Uh, so, uh, let me start to read some of the questions that have been submitted thus far. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see what I can answer that's of general interest. Uh, so somebody asked, what foods would you recommend to avoid eating and foods that are nutritious for those of us with lymphedema? It turns out that Nutrition plays a very limited role in the regression of lymphedema or preventing progression of lymphedema. We do know that bioflavonoids, which are present in fruits and vegetables, have a general positive effect on lymphatic function, although there isn't much evidence that the bioflavonoids actually uh, improve lymphedema. I would say the most important part of nutrition is um, really involved with the central role that obesity plays in the expression of lymphedema. One of the attributes that we see that is commonly, commonly present in cancer survivors who develop lymphedema is uh, an elevated BMI compared to the individuals who don't develop lymphedema. And when we look at lymphedema populations in general, there is a, quite a propensity toward obesity. So I think calorie control is the most important aspect that I can emphasize in relationship uh, to nutrition. Um, and okay, moving on, I have a next question. It says, thank you for the uh, symposium. Um, I'm looking to start a PhD program in the upcoming year and would like to know what field of study would most benefit the research for a cure or better treatment options. So I would say, I hope that what I've shared here will tell you that the opportunities are vast. I think um, delving more deeply into the genetics is one aspect that would be very helpful. We also know that we have tremendous requirements for improved imaging, both at a microscopic level and at an in vivo level. I think focusing on the immune functions of the lymphatics would be extraordinarily important. And uh, of course, uh, my personal interest is in uh, all of the inflammatory pathways that I think are important as well. Um, and uh, the, the second question this person asked is whether um, the drugs that I talked about eliminate the protein-rich fluid uh, that accumulates in lymphedema. The answer is yes. Basically, as we make the lymphatics more healthy by stimulating the regenerative process, we help to both clear protein and lymphatic fluid as well as to turn off the machinery that's driving uh, cellular proliferation that causes the non-fluid components of, um, of overgrowth that are uh, typical for, uh, for lymphedema. Um, the next question is, what are the thoughts on the surgical um, therapies for lymphedema? Uh, well, I think surgery is playing an increasing uh, role in uh, our approach to the clinical problem of lymphedema. And, the, and just to summarize, the types of surgeries that we do, we, what is uh, commonly useful for a broad array of patients with lymphedema are the debulking surgeries that are increasingly being done. Um, so this is uh, called uh, suction-assisted lipectomy, where uh, through a, a, a modification of liposuction uh, uh, that is used for cosmetic purposes, but is specifically designed for lymphedema, under general anesthesia, we can remove a lot of that overgrown tissue. Uh, most of it is uh, over of the fatty layer under the skin, and this will restore um, 
the limb to a much more manageable size where it becomes more amenable to chronic compression. This is not curative for the underlying lymphedema and um, we, we still have to deal with the fact that the lymphedema is present, but the volume of the limb can be dramatically reduced. To try to repair the lymphatics, there are a variety of microsurgical techniques that are used. Uh, sometimes we divert lymphatic flow from the lymphatics to the veins. This is called lymphatic venous anastomosis. And in other cases, we do uh, a, a flap surgical transfer of lymph tissue, a lymph node that is healthy, into the region that has lymphedema. And my vision of that surgery is that it helps to stimulate lymphatic regeneration uh, in a manner similar to the medications that I've uh, talked about. These surgeries are not uniformly successful, but they, I would say there's about a 75% success rate um, in terms of uh, some responsiveness to the surgery, and sometimes the response is quite dramatic. Uh, we still have a lot to learn about who are the best candidates for this, what are the best surgical techniques of the varieties that are used, and, um, and when we should do this and in what stage of, of, of the presentation of the lymphedema. There's also a question about stem cells. I think there's been some interest in stem cells. Uh, I don't think that this aspect of the work has taken off quite as dramatically as some of the other areas. So I can't comment too meaningfully except to say that there are some animal model systems that suggest that stem cells can play a role uh, in lymphatic regeneration. Um, I have a question that asks whether women of color are more affected with lymphedema than, than others. And um, to the best of my knowledge, no, I don't think that we've seen that there is a, a racial or, um, or demographic bias uh, in this regard. Uh, I think that it would be fair to say, but we need much more replete information in the biorepository, but it's safe to conjecture that as in many other medical conditions, uh, it is likely that uh, individuals of color have reduced access to care and therefore their lymphedema might progress more rapidly or might be less well controlled than in the individuals uh, uh, you know, who, who are able to seek care at an early stage in the lymphedema process. But I don't believe that, um, that individuals of color are, are predisposed with all the other risk factors being identical to, to a greater degree of lymphedema than those uh, individuals that are not of color. Um, another question, what books can I recommend to read that, uh, want, that for individuals that wish to understand this condition uh, better? Well, I can, I can recommend the fact that our colleagues uh, at St. George's uh, Hospital uh, in London, uh, Peter Mortimer has written a kind of book uh, for uh, lymphedema that is directed toward um, the non-physician, non-scientist audience, and certainly that might be of use, and I believe you'll find some information about that on the LEARN website. In, in any event, LEARN can provide information on how to best acquire that book. Um, in, a, in, 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 a, in a moment of um, self-advertisement, I also want to say that uh, for those that are interested in this in a more scientific or comprehensive medical context, uh, I uh, have served as an editor uh, a textbook uh, on lymphedema that is now um, basically 61 chapters and uh, about a thousand pages in length. So it's probably everything you ever wanted to know about lymphedema. Uh, it is uh, published by Springer and it's called A Concise Compendium. Uh, and this uh, book, if you look for it on Amazon, is purchasable um, a little bit cheaper than if you get it directly from the publisher. From the publisher, you can also download individual uh, PDFs of chapters if you have specific uh, aspects of the, um, of the subject matter that you're interested in. Um, another question, uh, should those of us have an annual checkup with a lymphedema physician? Well, you know, unfortunately, I, I have to say, in all honesty, it's really hard to come up with a lymphedema physician even today uh, in, in the United States. Um, there are still 
little more than a handful of individuals who profess a specialty expertise in this. I do think regular surveillance by a physician who professes interest in the lymphedema is important. I think the treatment program should be revisited on a regular basis. And, um, and it's important to uh, not simply let this thing go because it can be controlled in a variety of ways. It can be improved potentially in a variety of ways, but it, like any chronic medical condition, it needs a, uh, a strong interaction with, uh, with healthcare providers. Um, so somebody is asking if there are current trials of inhibitors with adults with primary lymphedema and how might I be considered? Uh, trials for primary lymphedema specifically, to my knowledge, do not yet exist. We are continuing at Stanford to uh, investigate this anti-inflammatory realm, and all of our studies have included patients with primary lymphedema. So um, our mechanistic studies are not zeroed in on specific causes of lymphedema. We're looking at the attributes of lymphedema that are common to all, both primary and secondary. So anybody who has primary lymphedema who is interested and who meets the entry requirements, uh, you know, should certainly, if you're interested, um, uh, contact us. It is important to understand that um, clinical trials are not necessarily a shortcut to the best treatment. It is a way to be exposed to treatments that are under development. It is a way to advance the field of uh, research. But most importantly, one needs to understand that uh, research is done in real time as hands-on work. Uh, it requires typically multiple visits to the site at which the research is being done. So for those of you that are interested in the work that we're doing, you have to have the ability to come uh, to, uh, to Stanford, uh, at least on a few occasions during the time that you're enrolled in the study in order for us to do the work that needs to be done. That's really the beauty of the, of the registry. You don't have to go anywhere. You do that research from the sanctity of your own home and sitting in front of your computer screen. And in these days of the pandemic, that's really a blessing because it allows research to move forward uh, uh, in, in a way that, uh, that, is, is really very, very meaningful. Um, so let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, somebody asked, could PF4 elevation be a reason for cellulite formation as well? I would say the answer is no, because both in the animal model, cellulite is a kind of regionalized obesity, if you want to think of it that way. Cellulite happens because there is a regional um, disproportion in the way that the uh, subcutaneous fat grows and that creates the external irregularities that we call cellulite. What we consistently see both in the animals and in the human uh, studies that we've done is that the PF4 elevation seems to be um, uh, independent of the obesity issue. It really is about the lymphatic component. And so unless the cellulite is there on the basis of, of a lymphatic defect, and that would really be a form of lipedema as far as we understand, then, uh, then no, it shouldn't be uh, related. Uh, what are my thoughts on lymphedema massage? Lymphedema massage is a wonderful way to potentially reduce the burden symptoms um, lymphedema massage, though, uh, to be perfectly frank, it's a little bit like asking me, what is the value of the dishwasher in my kitchen? Every time you put your dirty dishes into the dishwasher, they'll come out clean. But the next time you have a meal, they're going to get dirty again. So there isn't any lasting benefit to, to manual lymphatic massage. It is of the moment, of the moment by massaging the tissues and stimulating lymphatic contractility, we will help to mobilize lymphatic fluid. But because lymphatic fluid is, uh, is uh, uh, accumulated on a minute by minute basis, as soon as that lymphatic massage is completed, um, we return to baseline again. In fact, the dishwasher image isn't really even completely apt because if you put the dishes in the dishwasher and then don't use them again, they'll stay clean. But in the human body, we keep using all the parts, and so the um, lymphatic fluid will reaccumulate. Um, 
Now, my last question, and then I'm going to have to say goodbye for today. Somebody asked, um, didn't the Ubenimex trial, um, was the Ubenimex trial or the Bistatin trial done with IGA reported as unsatisfactory? Basically, there was no report of the outcome of the Ubenimex trial. What I can tell you is that based on our first glimpse at the data, the company that supported the trial decided that they wanted to move in a different direction, despite the fact that we as scientists see a lot of interest there and feel that there is data that is to be explored and that this is a first attempt to uh, try to understand the impact of this treatment. I will tell you that in my opinion, um, the study, uh, which was designed by the sponsor, although led by me, was underpowered, meaning it wasn't designed to have enough patients enrolled in it to draw statistical conclusions, which is um, part of the disappointment of the experience. However, um, we're seeing very, very interesting molecular signals from what we acquired in that study, as well as the fact that there were some extraordinarily dramatic responders to the drug in the trial, which is why uh, I maintain my interest in the drug and in the pathway and hope to have very exciting news for you uh, in the near future. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for your participation in this uh, symposium. I hope I got to answer at least some of your questions. Once again, I want to encourage everyone who's listening, go to that registry website, uh, invest 30 minutes or 40 minutes of your time so that you can drive this field significantly forward. And when we next convene in a year or two, maybe we'll have even much more dramatic things to tell you about where this field has gone. Thanks so much for being a part of this uh, presentation and a part of this learned community. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.